And our last talk for the session by Asaf Arbel and Tami Ritlin Aviv uh, from Ben Gurion. Good afternoon. Thank you, everyone, for staying so late. I really appreciate it. I will do my best to make your effort worth it. Um, this work is done together with my PhD student, Safar Bell, who is unfortunately cannot be here. He's sick with fever. This is really unfortunate. Uh, I think the credit for the presentation and the work uh, goes for him. And uh, this talk focuses on um, cell segmentation in time-lapse microscopy videos. Um, as you can see, there are a lot of other problems related to one, and we believe that principle that we present here today um, can be applicable to a variety of segmentation problems of similar objects in videos. So our motivation is to do um, cell image segmentation, and our collaborators are interested in cancer study, um, study of stem cells and possible therapies, and for that they need um, some traits about the cells, uh, they want to count cells, they want to learn about protein levels in cells, cell structure, morphology, dynamic, cell-to-cell -cell interaction, proliferation rate, linear, uh, lineage analysis, and more. And in order to do that, you need to have exact, accurate, individual cell segmentation. However, this is a very challenging problem. So there are many challenges. Um, you can see that the cell varies in their appearance. Here you can see different cell sequences. Uh, you can see fluorescent sequence. You can see DAC. You can see uh, phase contrast sequence. Uh, you can see that the cells sometimes are very similar to each other. There are multiple instances. Um, cell splits, they divide. They come and go to the field of view. And on the top of that, it is really difficult to separate touching neighboring cells, in particular since uh, the boundaries are not well defined, um, out of focus artifacts, and cells partially occlude each other. Now, if you consider existing approaches, in particular cell video segmentation, then they can categorize into two classes. They are the non temporal ones, that is, cells are segmented in a frame-by-frame -frame manner independently. And there are the temporal one, where motion and dynamics is exploited to facilitate the segmentation. Now, in recent years, there is another dimension to the related workspace. Deep learning versus non-deep learning. So, you can segment cells using classical manners and deep learning manners. You can exploit temporal domain or not. And in our work, what we aim to do is to exploit recent advances in deep learning together with the temporal domain. So our problem can be formulated as follows. We would like to partition the image domain into individual cells and background. However, there are multiple cells in multiple frames, in multiple sequences, and we don't know the number in advance. So instead, we define the problem as a three-class segmentation problem. We partition the image domain into foreground, the cell region, background, here in red, and another class, cell boundaries. Here you can see it in blue. So this third class allows us to separate or distinguish touching or neighboring cells. Our problem can be formulated as follows. We considered the images i and the segmentation gamma as two independent random variables. We look for the joint uh, probability, it is unknown. So if we had a conditional probability of these two parameters, we could estimate the maximum a posteriori estimator and find out about cell segmentation. So in our work, we will try to define estimator that will be as close as possible to the optimal one. In order to do so, we define an estimator as a deep neural network. Before I get into the details of the estimator, I would like to consider the loss. 
So there are many ways to define the loss in a straightforward manner. We can talk about L1 loss, L2 loss. We can talk about coarse entropy loss. All these losses are pixel-wise. And we want to add some holistic principle into it. So this is why we talk about adversarial loss. So the main ideas are inspired by Similan work, by Goodfellow, um, at all, uh, the pixel fix work of efforts at all. And the idea is as follows. We have a segmentation and we would like to tell whether this segmentation comes from the estimator or from the manual segmentation from an expert. Once we do so during training, we can uh, elaborate our estimator and have a better one during test time. So this is an adversarial loss uh, mechanism, we have two adversarial networks, the estimator or the conditional generator and the discriminator. And what we wish to know is what is the difference between the manually segmented cells and the output of the estimator. So in order to do that, uh, we would like to solve the following min-max problem. And for that, let's talk about the discriminator. What would do a naive discriminator? We can add the segmentation as an input to a CNN, for example, and for, um, uh, on the top of it, we can test whether this is a true segmentation or fake segmentation. Fake seg segmentation is a segmentation generated by the generator. However, we can do better if we do as an input both the raw image and the segmentation so we can, for example, concatenate uh, these two inputs. But this is quite naive. Uh, the segmentation and the image are concatenated right from the beginning. So we cannot compare the high-level features, just the low-level ones. Instead, we, one can think about CISME's approach. So we have two CMEs networks, and we can feed each channel with either the row segmentation or the row image and concatenate them at the last layer. Again, you only compare the high-level feature. What about the mid-level features or the low-level features? What we propose is a new architecture. It is called the rib cage, uh, a discriminator architecture. So we have three channels here. We have the left rib, the right rib. We feed uh, the raw image and the segmentation in the left and the right rib. And then we have the spine that merge those two um, inputs together. So if you would like to have a look at a single unit of a rib cage, here it goes. We have the input from the image, input from the segmentation. Then we have concatenation, convolutional layer, batch normalization, leaky value. Now in the further unit, we also have the input from the spine. And this is an overview of our discriminator, the ribcage discriminator, and RC is for ribcage, and FC is for fully convolutional. Now in the first part, I would like to do an intermediate sum up and just show some experiments we did with our collaborator data set. This uh, data set is from OEL on Lab, uh, the Weizmann Institute. Uh, we compare the result to the VGG16 and also to uh, segmentation result using deep learning but with cross entropy loss. And here you can see some quantitative results and here you can see a zoom in of some cells together and you can see that better separation can be obtained using adversarial loss. Quantitative results are shown as well here, and we compare the precision, the recall, the F score, the Jacquard distance uh, for the ribcage architecture, cross entropy only loss, VGG16, and the elastic, which is a semi manual, semi automatic um, tool that is quite common. Uh, however, Maybe we can do better than that, and now we are going to talk about the estimator. Now, if you want to utilize the time domain, we definitely should consider not uh, inserting just a single frame, but a sequence of frame to our estimator. Now, a common way 
in order to do segmentation, this is in a frame-by-frame -frame manner, is using the unit. Uh, we've already um, hear about the unit today. The unit is an encoder, decoder with skip connection, and it's um, found out to be very um, efficient to do cell segmentation, and actually Ronenberg et al., who proposed the unit, did it for the first time for cell segmentation. However, we would like to exploit dynamic, and this is what we are going to do, and in order to motivate why we are going to do that, I would like to ask you how many cells do you see in this frame? Anyone? Three, two. Where are they located? What is the shape of these cells? You know, even human annotator would not be able to do much with this frame. But if I show you the history, and I hope you can see it here. Um, okay, so tracing the cells, we can say much more. How many are they? What are the shape? Where are they located? And in order to exploit this history, we use recurrent neural network. So recurrent neural network will allow us to utilize cell history, past appearances, and facilitate cell by uh, cell segmentation. In fact, we do not use uh, recurrent neural network per se. We use convolutional along uh, short-term memory, and we use these units in our framework. Now, in order to utilize the multi-scale structure of the unit and the LSTM, we simply incorporate or integrate the LSTM within the units so we can have past appearance of the cells in multi-level. Doing so in the encoder flow, we can have both the multi-scales and the dynamic. To test the algorithm or the fused network, we use what we call the cell tracking challenge data. The cell tracking challenge is an ongoing um, challenge for many years. Um, different uh, groups um, worldwide compete in this challenge. Uh, the main idea is that there are training sets, annotated data, and they are publicly available. We train our networks using these data sets, and then we send the trained networks to the organizer of the challenge. They run the network on the test data. It's data that we, uh, our network didn't see before. And uh, we tested for different sequences, the fluorescent one, the DIC, and the phase contrast. And here you can see that we won the first place for the fluorescent data. Um, the DAC, the second one, and the fifth place for the phase contracts one. And the um, um, numbers you can see here are the calculation of the Jacquard measure, um, and here you can see its definition. Now, what we wanted to do, and these are really fresh results, so we don't have the organizer rate for that, uh, we wanted to incorporate the LSTM with the unit with the adversarial loss that I've shown before. In order to do that, what we did is we took simulated data. Um, the simulated data, we don't need any ground truth. We have a ground truth, it's just a simulation. And we tested it on a true fluorescent data that you see here. We did it for two different sequences. And here you can see comparison. We compare the simple unit, LSTM plus unit, and the LSTM plus unit plus adversarial loss. And here you can see that using both the integrated approach, we can have much better results. So, to sum up, uh, we presented a three class loss. Uh, we presented a different way of implementing the discriminator as a rib cage. We integrated the unit with the LSTM, and we show this um, have a really um, significant value. And here you can see some uh, quantitative results for uh, the entire sequences that we tested. That's it. Thank you. Thanks. How do you treat the imbalance in the number of pixels assigned to each class? You have very few pixels assigned to the border, and they are the most important pixels. So how do you assign them proper weight? Sorry, didn't hear that. 
Yes. So you need to classify pixels into foreground, background, and border. And the boundary, yes. So the boundary pixel seems to be very important. How do you assure that they have a proper weight? Well, The boundary pixels are very sparse, so you might, have, might as well just label them as foreground or background and the loss will be, the difference will be negligible. So how do you enforce the fact that you want the boundary yeah. pixels to be labeled that? So we rate, it, uh, we rate um, um, the cost of the different classes, so we give more uh, to the boundary. Uh, um, we don't do anything in particular. So the traditional unit, you have um, a cost that is weighted toward the boundary. There are two classes and you have weights, uh, depending where are you located. But here we don't do anything in particular. We just give. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, you discussed the difference between frame-by-frame uh, -frame classification and your approach that is a temporal approach. Uh, your temporal approach still treats each frame separately but has a memory component that integrates over time, the long-short-term long component. Have you tried 3D convolutions where you treat the video as a space-time volume? This is definitely a different approach that could be tested using uh, 3D, but we haven't, uh, we haven't tested it. Um, part of it because uh, once you do 3D convolutional um, and there are dif differences, significant differences between frames, um, then it wouldn't work that well. I mean, there might be, you know, cells may not overlap between frame to frame. So this concludes our uh, vision day. I, I think we should thank the hosts once again, both Chai and uh, Raja. Thank you very much. And we'll see you all next year.